so my specialty, I'm a functional nutritionist, uh, functional care versus Western care is means you're really looking at the root cause. So instead of just putting a Band-Aid on symptoms, you're looking at uh, what's actually causing those symptoms. So the Band-Aid's not going to fix what's underlying. And there's so many things that, that could be causing any given symptom, and everyone's going to need a little bit of a different approach. Hello, my friend, and welcome to Something for Everybody. My name is Aaron Mashbitz. Taylor, welcome to the show. Thank you, Aaron. I'm happy to be here. Absolutely. First question, most important question. How are you doing? Actually, how are you doing? I like that you say actually. I think a lot of people just say that they're great and they're not. Um, I'm okay. I'm not great. I'm not bad. I'm just okay. And I'm actually grateful for that because there's been times when I've been less than okay. So I'm okay with having an okay day. I hope everyone else is too. Yeah. What did the what did the less than okay days teach you about, you know, your life right now? Mm, the less than okay days taught me that kind of what we were just talking about earlier. The the things that you think you need, those big ideal visions of what's perfect and what matters in life actually doesn't. It's really about those small day-to-day -day interactions. So I was always really focused on building this huge career, getting as much education as possible, doing all the things, getting all the accolades. Um, and in reality, that didn't make me happy at all. It made me probably get to the worst spot in my life. And what really makes me feel okay are those little things, breathing, getting outside, having a good social connection, nothing to do with external validation. Yeah. I was listening to um, a podcast right before this, sort of in preparation to get sort of my mind right. And uh, one of the guys said that you should have a love affair with the present moment. And I was mm -hmm. like, whoa, that's like really, you know, because everyone talks about, you know, loving what is, being present. But like that sort of for me, like combined it all together and um, and really made it concrete. And so I've been thinking about that ever since and now this con I mean, it wasn't that long ago. So it's not like, you know, I've been thinking about yeah. it for, for four days. It's been like, you know, 45 minutes, but, mm -hmm. um, but it's still, um, you know, and then that resonated with what you were saying. So was there, um, was there like a tipping point for you? Was there like an aha moment or was this like a slow oh, yeah. sort of progression where you wanted to change, you know, your life? You know, it's both, it's both because I think that by the time anyone hits a tipping point and like that actual breaking point of like, holy shit, my life is a mess. I need to change it. You've been living that way for years and years and decades. And if you think about the choices that you've made and the thought process behind those choices, those thought processes could go all the way back to childhood. So it could be decades worth of, of work that you have to go into. Um, and that was definitely it for me, but with, you know, my, path. I was working full-time in tech. I was going to grad school at night. I had a very poor personal life um, that I wasn't addressing because I didn't have the capacity. I didn't have the um, sense of self-worth that I needed. And it really all did hit at once. So it was one of those things that it was gradual, but all of a sudden um, where I worked in the health and wellness space, I work in holistic care, but I could not figure out how to care for myself. And then one day my body just shut down. And my mind had been slowly shutting down. My body had been slowly shutting down. I was so frustrated with myself because I was like, this is my, this is my thing. I have so much education and I think I can help all these people, but I can't even help myself. Um, but it was shocking how quickly it happened. I would say within a matter of months, it was just like every alarm bell in my mind and my body was just telling me, nope, you know, we've been telling you to rest for years and you've been ignoring it. So now we're going to force it. And that's a, that's an awful feeling, but it does come quickly. And I, I work with a lot of burnout um, and adrenal fatigue and, and emotional wellness in my practice. And it's, I feel like that's kind of the story, you know, it's, it's years and years just pent up the way that you've chosen to live and it just hits you all at once and your body will force you to rest in the least convenient moment also. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we, we're currently in a, a human energy crisis. Um, and so that sort of feeling, uh, I think is very relevant for majority of people who are listening to this. Um, cause I come from a, from a sports background and so everything was always about grind, 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 grind. And I can't say that you're not going to achieve basically anything in life unless you work hard. So that, that yeah. is a, that is an important piece 
to understand. But I think now what's so important is what you're touching on is that if you don't sleep or rest or breathe or nap or take a break or do any of these things, then you're, you literally can't be at full capacity on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you're trying mm -hmm. to be the best in the world, the best mom, the best son, a good student, open your own practice, start a business, and you haven't built a foundational layer of, I'm going to get eight hours of sleep every night. I read this study because I wrote my newsletter about this, but mm -hmm. the best performers in the whole world, on average, sleep eight hours and 36 minutes every night. No questions Amazing. asked, mm -hmm. done deals, non-negotiable. And that should be publicized everywhere. That should be like stamped in schools, on teachers' foreheads, like just, yes. you know, everywhere because nobody Basic thinks about skill. that. Yeah. Nobody thinks – when you hear about – like when they talk about these athletes or anyone doing something great on TV, they talk about how hard they work. But mm -hmm. they never say like this person almost gets nine hours of sleep every night literally no matter what the, that's like a non-negotiable they could be out with friends okay it's about 9 30 sorry guys i gotta wind down because i wake up at five every morning that's my schedule even on the weekends i stick to it now mm -hmm. there's room for fun of course there's conversation for that but you have to get the foundational layer down first before you start to build anything i think yeah and that should be a conversation and something that gets me so angry about what happens with the clients that I work with and what I've seen in myself is that the hustle and the grind is celebrated. And it's like, you get all these pats on the back for doing all these things. And it's in our society, that's like the best thing you can do is hustle. But in reality, your body is breaking down. There are physiological implications from this hustle culture. Um, and the fact that people admire you more, if you do more, if you can keep more balls in the air without dropping them is so backwards. And, you know, when you're talking about like, you know, athletics, I, I think about Tom Brady a lot when they talk about his routine, how, how perfect it is. And yeah, you need a lot of help. You need a lot of money to be able to do that. I'm from Boston. That's why it's coming into my mind. Um, but it's always about how disciplined and all of the things, every minute being scheduled, all these different things that can go on. What about chilling out? You know, and I feel like there's been more conversation recently since COVID about just relaxing. That's a huge part of success, a huge, huge part of success. That's not what's highlighted. What's highlighted is you don't sleep. You want something. You're passionate about it. You let it overtake your life. Mm, is that really what works for people? Right. Yeah, you need a sense of, of go get it. And it's going to take a little bit of effort and sacrifice if you're trying to do something that's a little bit different. But it shouldn't be that it's your entire life is hustling and grinding. And that's all that matters. And that's the only thing that people will applaud. That's the other issue is it's, it gets so much validation mm -hmm. of like, look how much you're doing, look how well you're doing, where even if you say, actually, I'm really struggling, I know I'm doing a lot, but I'm having a really hard time with it. It's no, keep going, look how well you're doing, just keep at this and imagine five years from now. It's like, well, actually imagine five years from now when you've been doing all these things to your body and your mind, you haven't been taking care of either. You know, this picture of success, maybe you'll get to the position you wanna be at work, maybe you'll have that killer business, but what are you sacrificing along the way? And what's actually important? Are you sacrificing family, health, side hobbies, all of these other things that are important, social connections? But cool, I got this job title, so I've made it in America. Yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah, because that that hustle part is is sexy, right? It looks yeah. Good. It's like mm, that person. Oh, but that no, that person like does a breathing practice or. Uh, gets to bed on time or wakes up early or mm -hmm. snaps on average like two hours a week. Like what is, why is he napping? Why isn't he like sending emails or like, you know, why, why isn't he cold outreaching? Why isn't he working on his sales pitch? <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah. Cause, but I, yeah, it, cause it's hard to, it's hard to always like demonize the effort, right? Like you said, because yeah. you have to have it. There has to be some sort of motivation for you to get up and do the work. For but sure. you can live. You can live in harmony. I think that's true. I don't think balance exists. Um, mm -hmm. I, like that. I don't know where. where ba I don't know what to balance. I think I it can... exists. I think it's just personalized. That's why we can't define it. Mm, Everyone's okay. body needs a little bit of something different, and someone may feel great on seven hours of, of sleep a night, and someone may need nine. So it's mm. balance is going to look different to other people. Some people are mm. extroverted, and some people are introverted. So social connection, that balance is going to look different. Um, but we're not really taught those skills to find that balance and to really pay attention to our body. And because your body is constantly telling you what it needs, it's constantly telling you 
how you feel when your own brain is not telling you how it feels because you consciously do not want to think about it. But, you know, if we can pay attention to our bodies and listen to what is balanced for me, when do I feel my best, not just physically, um, but emotionally, not just when it comes to when am I the most um, achieving the most, then I think you can create your balance. But it takes a lot of intentionality and it takes a lot of effort and it's not easy to, to reflect and realize that there's things in your life that's not serving you. So we ignore it and we just keep going on with the things that's easy, like climbing up the corporate ladder, making more money, being able to buy more things, not really focusing on what actually matters. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, little segue as a, as the great podcaster that I am, you know, cheers. <laughs> um, but, um, you have on your website, um, understand your body holistically. And I just like to know what that means, um, for the people you work with, what that means for you. Um, mm -hmm. and really it's just wrap our brains around that idea of holistic health. Absolutely. And, and I appreciate you doing your research into my, my little website. Um, nice I did website. put thought into, into putting that up front because it's something I believe in really, um, really deeply. And that's, what's helped me the most in life understanding my own body holistically. Um, so my specialty, I'm a functional nutritionist, uh, functional care versus Western care is means you're really looking at the root cause. So instead of just putting a Band-Aid on symptoms, you're looking at uh, what's actually causing those symptoms. So the Band-Aid's not going to fix what's underlying. And there's so many things that, that could be causing any given symptom, and everyone's going to need a little bit of a different approach. What bothers me about our healthcare system, I think there's a lot of practitioners out here that kind of feel this pain. There's a lot of different you know, areas that we can improve in healthcare. But something that um, is challenging for me is how segmented healthcare is. So you have a primary care physician, you have a thyroid issue, so you go to an endocrinologist, you have a gut health issue, so you go to a gastroenterologist, but then you have depression and you completely separate from the, the physical care and you go over to a, a psychiatrist and a psychologist and none of those interact, none of it. You know, the dichotomy between physical and mental is huge in the healthcare system, but even the, the, the separation between the body systems is just it's what our healthcare system is based off of. And having specialties is great because people have all sorts of crazy disorders where you do need someone who is hyper-focused on hormones. So you need your endocrinologist. But then it begs the question, who's piecing this all together? So when you have someone that has, you know, subclinical conditions, meaning there's not an actual diagnosis going on, but they just wake up every day and they feel like shit. I'm tired. I have no energy. I really need to sleep, but I can't. I can't turn my brain off. I feel wired at night. I feel exhausted in the morning. My stomach hurts all the time. My chest feels tight. My throat feels constricted. Well, the healthcare system doesn't know what to do with you. They're going to throw you to a bunch of specialists that are going to run some basic lab work, and it's probably going to come back normal um, because you don't have a, a strong clinical disease. And then you're just lost and you have nowhere to go. And you're basically just told you're healthy go figure it out. Um, and that tends to be the sort of client base that I work with. So when I'm thinking about holistically, I tend to have people come in and they're very, very frustrated because they don't have a, a glaring disease. They don't have this lab result that was completely out of whack that indicated you need this medication, you need this you know, straightforward treatment. It's just everything came back normal or slightly, slightly off where it, there's no clear intervention but I have no answers because I'm not dying. So they're not going to help me, but I feel absolutely terrible quality of life, super low. And it's a vicious, vicious cycle. When you're physically feeling sick, you're going to mentally feel sick. You mentally feel sick. You're going to get you know, physically more sick. I can go into much more detail about what's happening physiologically there. But when I think about helping people holistically, it's how do we piece this together? You know, you've been to a bunch of different specialists who have all told you that you're, you're okay. You have symptoms that could overlap a million different things going on. So how can we really look at what's happening in your mind, what's happening mentally, physically, spiritually, socially, all those small aspects of lifestyle that no one talks about, like sleep and stress and support, movement, and movement not just meaning that you go to the gym and you lift weights for 30 minutes, you know, the body needs all sorts of movement, are you getting sunlight? You know, all of these different things that really do impact our hormone systems, they impact our nervous system, which impacts everything. And once one little thing is off, especially when it comes to hormones and it comes to the nervous system, that's when you start getting all of these really vague but bothersome symptoms that normal healthcare cannot support that is so deserving of help because people's quality of life is just 
completely tanked. Um, so when I think about holistic, it's really combining all of that. And I'm a certified health coach and a functional nutritionist. So I think a lot of people think I'm focusing mostly on nutrition. And I try to be very, very clear that that's not holistic to just think about food because food is not going to solve this for you. It's a huge piece, but it's not everything. And we have to talk about what's going on in your mind and what's going on in your life. There's not going to be a magic pill to fix it. And it's going to be a really hard journey to take that, that look at what's going on. Uh, but it's the missing piece in healthcare. I mean, I don't know the last time I, I went to, I don't even know how many GI doctors for my issue since I was a little kid that just told me I was completely fine. Um, and it's a real hopeless, hopeless feeling. And no one told me anything else about, you know, the, the brain gut connection. And that ended up being the huge missing piece for me mm -hmm. is, is what was going on within my brain, within my own mental health. But you don't get educated on that. of like, okay, your stomach hurts, but, um, and you're really tired and you feel all these different things, but your labs are normal. How are you feeling? You know, kind of like how you opened this podcast and how are you actually, when's the last time a doctor actually said that? I'm not sure I ever got asked that in my entire life. Maybe when I sought out therapy, but never did a, you know, physical body doctor ever ask me, how am I actually doing? Even though all of my symptoms were tied back to that. And eventually when, you know, everything came back normal and I did have doctors say, oh, well, you should probably just take an antidepressant. Like, hmm, can you explain to me why? Or did you just reach the end of your own scope and the only other tool you can think is to, to throw a pill at me to see if that will help? You know, there's not a lot of delicacy around the conversation with mental health either. And, you know, these visits are so short, there's not even time to have a delicate conversation. Right. Um, so, you know, for me, if I can just piece things together for people and help them understand their body, education is absolutely critical when it comes to healthcare. Um, in general, I mean, even if you feel completely healthy and you're completely fine, we're not taught how the body works. We're not taught how the nervous system works. We're not taught how, like, why sleep is important. We're not taught that. So if I can help people find those tools, that's going to improve their life and help them feel some control. Because a lot of the times when people are coming to me, they don't feel in control. And I felt that way. I'm sure you felt this way in your life. Feeling like you can't trust your own body is just a horrifying feeling because you don't know what's going to happen next. And you can't trust that you can even plan something a month in advance because you don't know how you're going to feel. So if you can understand your body and how it's all working together, not just the physical, but again, the mental is huge. Um, you can really change your life and you can build tools that are going to help you forever and make you happier and more fulfilled. Um, so that's what holistic means to me. Very long winded answer. Uh, hopefully some of that made some sense. Yeah. Perfect. Amazing. No, I want all the, the longest winded answers that you possibly have. Please. <laughs> um, yeah. I think like, because like the amount of frustration that you could have as a person where you're going to the doctor and you know, you don't feel good. Like, you know, and like most people don't go to the doctor like the first day they feel don't they don't feel good like unless they have yeah. like it's outrageous right they have a huge fever they're vomiting all night like things that are crazy but they just have this like constant nagging like a little bit they get like you said they get like super tired at 4 p.m. and then it happens for like six seven eight nine ten months then they're like okay maybe I should go see the doctor then they see the doctor and the doctor says no nope, you're good Th that frustration leaving that place knowing that that person is not right but you're supposed to trust them because they're really good at certain things. Like Western medicine is really good at certain things. Like yeah. you need to, you tore your ACL, fucking sweet. Yeah. Need that really good at those type of things. But these like personal interactions, one, I, I don't want to fully just say I blame the doctor because they're controlled by other people and other things Absolutely. that say mm -hmm. you have to see 400 people in the next hour. And so you have less than 30 seconds to talk to this person. You better figure it out. And so mm -hmm. I, I get it, I get it, but there has to be something that we can do differently. And so like the quote that always pops out to me when I think about this is that it's, it's no measure of health to be well adjusted to a profoundly sick society. Oh, I love that. You know, like, so people yeah. think that now that it's, it's normal and it's okay for them to be tired mm -hmm. at 4 p.m. It's not, I have, a, it's almost 4 p.m. here, it's 2.30. In an hour and a half, I will not be tired. I will do something else. I'll probably go for a walk. Like that's, it's, it's not normal, but it's so, we're so well adjusted to our society being so sick and tired that we just yep. be like, oh, okay, well, cool. I'm, I'm tired mm -hmm. at 4 PM and then I'm going to go home and I'll sort of like try to be awake and 
able for my kids, but I'm like a little tired still. And maybe I'll be like a little naggy to my, like there's so many downstream effects to just like this little thing that you think. And then we try to talk to a professional and that professional said, no, you're, you're good. Like it's all, yeah. it's fine. Or my and favorite, so, you're just getting older. Once I hit my thirties, that's what I felt like I heard like, oh, your energy's dropping because you're just getting older. Well, I'm pretty sure I'm, I'm very young. And yeah. if this is how early it starts to not have any energy and to not feel good, I don't feel really good about my 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. Yeah. Like that that entire picture that we just slow down and our bodies just stop working at the young age of 30, 35 is just ridiculous. It really is. But it has been accepted. And I think a lot of what happens when you know you're talking about leaving that doctor's office and they're saying, you know, everything's fine. You're like, oh, they're not they're not supporting me. The other thing that can happen is you kind of gaslight yourself and you're like, oh God, mm. I am fine. So what's wrong? Am I like, is there something wrong in my head? Like, why, why am I complaining if everyone else feels this way? Why am I making a big stink out of it if everyone else is coping and there's some weakness inside of me that makes mm -hmm. it so I can't? And I think that happens to a lot of really hyper-independent people. Is it really does feel like a weakness that like, well, if everyone feels this tired, but they can get by and I can't, it's almost like an, you're internalizing. There's something wrong with me. There's a character trait that is not strong enough that I can't get through life the way that other people can. And that is a vicious cycle too. Yeah. Yeah. They see it as a, a character default Yeah, rather mm -hmm. than a, a system not working, which is totally yeah. different. I mean, James Clear talks about that in terms of habits, which is like the same thing. If your habits aren't working, it's not that you have, a, you're, there's nothing wrong with your character. There's nothing wrong with you. You just don't have the right system in place. I mean, and that's exactly true for, for healthcare. Like there's just not the right system in place. Like, mm -hmm. um, for us to, to thrive, to be fulfilled, to bring joy into our lives, to experience things outside of just work, to be able to go for a 30 minute walk in the middle of our work day. Like, what do you, why, why are you out of your desk? What are you, what are you doing? Were you eating lunch? Oh my no, gosh. Like, the amount of people that just like say they can't take a lunch break is just, it's so sad, but what's so sad about it is it's actually kind of true mm -hmm. because it really is a culture where you're not doing enough. You don't care enough. You don't want to get promoted. And I get that because we don't, we really don't have a culture of taking care of ourselves. So it's, it's hard to be the outlier and like decide, okay, well, I am going to take care of myself. But there is nothing in society that's going to help me do this. So I'm going to look weird and I'm going to look like I don't care about the things other people care about. Um, and then that could be another vicious cycle of like, well, then your coworkers look down on you or your peers look down on you because you're not prioritizing things in the way that, you know, the standard American does. And that can put you in a tough situation, too. You know, we don't have a culture that supports natural movement and healthy eating and sleep and stress management and meaningful social connections. We really don't. And Dan Buechner talks about this a lot with the blue zones. Are you familiar with the blue zones? Yeah, I've I've read and listened to a little bit about it, but um, yeah. Was... Oh gosh, you know, so it's one of these main things. You know, back when I was going through my, um, I don't know, existential crisis of what the hell was going on with me and why I felt like such shit and had this feeling so stuck of how to get out, I got obsessed with people that were happy. I mean, I I really, and this is probably. Um, I've been told I can intellectualize emotions too much and it's not a great thing. But for me, like I really wanted to, I could not fathom how people experienced happiness every day. Like it was just such an abnormal thought to me. I felt so distant. Um, so I started researching like the happiest people in the world. How are they doing it? Like genuinely, what, what are you doing? Um, and you know, most of it is not inside of our country, but I really got a, kind of obsessed with the blue zones. And it's really just this interesting project of different countries in the world where, you know, regions in the world where people live to a hundred and they, the most, so the most centurions per population. And they not only live to a hundred, they're like happy, they're thriving, they're mobile, they can take care of themselves, they're independent. Not how we view being a hundred years old in America. I mean, I'm, you know, they're like, oh, you're 32, you're tired because you're too old. No, not in the blue zones. There's people who are 102 and they're taking care of themselves and they're cooking dinner and they're farming and they're gardening and they're happy. And when you look at all of those different areas, you know, they kind of broke down, you know, looked at all these different regions, found the similarities. Only one part was diet, one out of like seven or eight. Um, and the rest of it was the communities. What's happening in the communities? What's happening in the social? What are the, the expectations of daily life? And when it's a normal expectation to 
garden and to walk and to socialize and to spend time with family and to have some sort of spirituality, devotion of whatever kind, and it doesn't even matter what, hanging out with friends, stress management, all of these things, there's, they say specifically that it is not in the US because our culture doesn't support it. And I remember being so discouraged when I read that, of, you know, there's, there's, there's little pop-up Luzon projects around the U.S. where, you know, they're trying to build these communities that can support healthful living and, you know, mind-body health. Um, but a lot of what they say, which I think is a brutal, honest truth, is our society in America does not support living in this way. We don't build cities in this way. We don't structure work this way. We don't prioritize things this way. And we, we value things as a society in a completely backwards way than these really healthy and happy countries. We value success, we value money, we value physical things, we value accolades. Instead of valuing feeling at peace, feeling like there's people in your life that you love and support and they love and support you and you're doing things that really fill your cup, we just don't value it. And you're kind of the outlier. So it's it's frustrating to think, okay, do I not live in a society that's ever gonna support this? But that's a mindset you intentionally have to choose to be okay being a little bit different Mm -hmm. be okay saying i don't want to go drinking all night because i'd rather get up and go hiking at five in the morning and i don't care if that's weird because that's what makes me happy and i don't really want to get drunk and hungover sorry or i don't want to take this job that's going to make me work 12 hours a day so i'm going to go do something else that makes me less money that makes me a lot more happier because that aligns with my values a lot of people aren't going to understand that because our society doesn't value it largely i think it's kind of shifting but it's still it's going to take a very very long time for that to shift um so it's one hand frustrating we live in a society that this is going to be really really hard but just because it's hard doesn't mean that it's impossible and if enough people talk about it because i think a lot of people are thinking about it but they don't talk about it and that's the problem that's why things like this are so important enough people care to be the outlier talk about the fact that it's okay. You can kind of find your community, find your support. And there is a path forward. It's not going to change the entire country overnight, but you can change your own life in a very, very small way. But it's worth it to be the weirdo. Oh, I mean, it's more than worth it. Like, you know, if you, if you take a quick trip to hell right now and, you know, you look over your dead body and you see the life that you could have lived, well, you can make you can make that decision right now, yeah. and oh, yeah. the, the the little micro communities that you create, and a community could be three people, and mm-hmm. that has a, a you know a positivity resonance that bleeds out into all the people that you look at because people see you doing that thing and they're like, why is that person like that? Like, why do they have joy? Mm-hmm. Why are they yeah. able to handle like these obstacles and adversity in life just like a little bit better? Okay, they still yeah. go through some of the things that I go through, but they feel like they have a better grasp on it and they're able to take care of themselves. Like, why? And so those little communities like are uh, <laughs> wickedly important. And, you know, people doing the work, there's people doing the work everywhere. And yeah. if you if you want to do that, then you have to go out and also find those people, whether they're online through a podcast, reading a book, you know, getting on Facebook and seeing where they're at in your local community. All of these things are possible. Um, and it makes me think about, um, this idea of collective action, which is like a Jonathan Haidt idea that he's talking about in terms of smartphone usage. And the same idea could be placed in this. Like I think about it cause I coach a baseball team and usually there's mm, 12, 13 kids on a team. And there's usually one kid that doesn't have a phone and they're like 12, 13, right? So it's sort of normal, sort of not normal to have a phone. And the one kid who doesn't have a phone, he's like, That's a weird kid, right? Like, yeah. But if we create, so there, in that sense, like no one's not going to, the parents aren't going to be like, oh, everyone else has a phone. I'm going to have a phone. But if we have collective action, like six, seven parents, not all 90, 100%, like even 40, 50, 60% have collective action, that is enough to force the hand on the other way. Now parents are like, oh, like eight kids don't have a phone. Well, maybe that's, the appropriate way I do it because we want to feel like we have a sense of belonging. And so if everyone's Mm -hmm. doing this thing, we're going to do this thing. And so if we can have that collective action in terms of the way we take care of ourselves or giving kids cell phone usage, that idea is so powerful because it doesn't mean 
everyone, not everyone is going to do everything. That just doesn't work. But mm -hmm. a little bit more people doing it than they are now, I think is really powerful. And I try to express that um, to the teams that I coach just because we have a lot of, I have a lot of rules and standards for phone usage and bringing it to the field and things like that. And so, mm -hmm. and I'm, I like try to lead by example. I'm not perfect, but I try to never have my phone on the field just as they know that coach isn't on his phone. I shouldn't be on my phone either. And those things are, are, are very important just of terms of, you know, having a, a bigger like impact on the way we do things. Now I related it to the phone usage, but that has a lot to do with our health. Um, it so. does. Well, I think just like the overall concept is what you're describing there with that, you know, if there's seven or eight parents and the other parents may see a different perspective. And that's, what's huge about personal growth is being able being curious about a different perspective and having your own beliefs challenged. That's how you grow. It's how you develop. You know, my belief system for a long time was that my self-worth was connected to whatever my job was. Mm. Um, I needed that challenge in a very hard way. And I think there's micro, micro beliefs that people have. You just had a quick little thing on core beliefs, which is something that I talk about all the time with people. I think it's so, so important. But those tiny little beliefs that you have, it impacts everything. And if you're not challenging those, you're not in a community where they can be safely challenged. You know, having a group of friends that can say, hey, I hear what you're saying, but here's a different perspective. And it's said with love and it's said with support. Uh, you're not going to grow. And it's interesting how a lot of these challenges do come from social pressure, mm -hmm. which is where kind of bad things come to. But, you know, there can be a, a good about seeing a group of people doing something different and allowing yourself to have the curiosity to learn, not necessarily accept. And there's a huge difference with that is you can learn about something and not decide to implement that in your personal life, but maybe mm -hmm. still just get a little bit of something out of it. And I wish that that was a little bit more prominent in society too, is just hearing out what other people think, uh, you know, what, how they live, how they choose to do things, because that's, you might get a little, a little something. I mean, I definitely got a little something from reading about all these random Nordic traditions that people <laughs> have that make them a little healthy. And I going to be able to do all those things. Absolutely not. But do I now find a lot of joy in just lighting a candle and allowing myself to be happy in peace with a big blanket? Yeah, absolutely. But challenging those perspectives is it puts you out of your comfort zone and you got to get out of your comfort zone. Um, cause a lot of the times the perspectives that you have are not the healthy ones. Yeah. Yeah. Very important. What, um, what do we know about, you know, gut health and why is it important? Oh, what do we know? How many hours do we have? <laughs> <laughs> so I am very passionate about this, not only because, you know, it's interesting, my journey with gut health. I have had issues with my stomach since I was a little kid. I genuinely cannot remember a time when I ate and my stomach didn't hurt. But I can vividly remember being in elementary school and mentioning to my best friend for the first time that, you know, well, my stomach hurts every time I ate because I thought everyone's stomach hurt every time they ate. I thought that was normal. And her being like, Oh, my stomach never hurts. And I was like, Oh, crap. Well, I guess I'm weird. Um, and you know, you don't, you normalize things. Kids are very resilient. You know, you, you experience what you experience and you assume that's normal. You don't really talk about it. So I probably wasn't in middle school until I, you know, it got, it got to a point where like, I really couldn't eat anything. So I went through the ringer with GI care, all of your basic tests, all of the, you're fine, get over it, figure out what your trigger foods are. I remember being like 14 years old and getting handed a sheet for a low FODMAP diet. You probably don't know what that is, but it's a very, very intense diet and nothing anyone should ever do without medical supervision. And I just was given this sheet of paper of like, stop eating all of these foods. Um, and that was the extent of my help. Um, I learned how to figure it out myself, but what, what's so interesting and you know, I can see a lot more in hindsight. I have had mental health issues since I was a kid. But, you know, I grew up in the in the 2000s and I don't think people talked about mental health as a kid. And it's it's nothing to do with my parents or the, the space that they created. It was just not the culture to say, I'm sad every day. I hate myself. I feel anxious every time I have to do anything. You just sucked it up and you got over it. Um, so I could start to see as I got older what was happening. And my, my turning point with my gut health was... When I was in college, I had a real bad few months. I had something happen that was unfortunate. And all of a sudden I couldn't eat. I lost 10 pounds in a month. I truly could not find a single food to eat where I did not get viciously sick after. Um, and the doctor told me I was normal and everything was fine. So I kind of went on this journey to, you know, become a healthcare professional myself and, and try to, to figure it out. And I found functional medicine and it worked. But when I found functional medicine, 
and I learned about the gut brain connection, which I'll go into a little bit more. Um, it answered everything for me, like all the way back into childhood. You know, if I had been able to care for my mind, if I had gotten the care that I needed, if the doctors had asked the right questions in a safe way, because I do remember one point being young and the doctor asking me if I was feeling sad and I just didn't feel safe saying, yeah, I feel sad. You know, I was like 13 years old. <laughs> um, but you know, when I look back on that experience in college, it's all, it's just so crystal clear, you know, what happens, but gut health. So it's getting a lot more um, media attention, a lot more healthcare attention. And I think there's a lot of good in there and maybe a little bit of bad. Um, basically people are starting to realize that kind of a cornerstone, a foundation of our health is the, the health of our gut. We make a lot of neurotransmitters in there. We, our immune system is pretty much in our gut. We are what we eat, but we're mostly, we are what we digest. So you could have the most perfect diet, but if you don't have the digestive system to actually absorb and assimilate all of those nutrients, you're, it really doesn't matter that you just met all of your, your servings of fruits and vegetables that day. So there's a lot more attention about it. I think what can get a little bit challenging in the world of social media is that all of a sudden everyone's a gut health expert when maybe they didn't actually go through any professional training to understand the intricacies of gut health. I think there's a lot of one size fit all protocols that are being put out that really aren't going to super support people. On the flip side, there are people who really, really do know what they're talking about, and it can provide a lot of answers to people. And I think the gut-brain connection is the biggest, biggest thing. And there's a lot of um, even like bigger healthcare systems that are paying more attention to the gut-brain connection now. And really what that means is there's, you know, a nervous system in our gut, the enteric nervous system, and then we have our central nervous system. Your gut and your brain are connected through the vagus nerve. What you feel sends signals to your gut. What's going on in your gut sends signals to your brain. So this is now, you know, fully acknowledged in the medical field, which is huge. So for something to be actually acknowledged as real and existing in Western medicine, there has to be so much evidence, so much study, so much of this stuff. So the fact that we've gotten to that point in healthcare is absolutely phenomenal. And it's exciting to think about where this can go. But essentially... Your microbiome, the the different little bacteria and microbes that are existing in there, that's going to change kind of everything. A lot of people have some what's called dysbiosis, meaning that it's just it's off kilter. You know, it, it's not optimized. And when that can happen with antibiotic use, it can happen with stress. Um, it can happen with diet if you're not eating a lot of the good stuff that really feeds that microbiome, and then that has you know this massive effect on. Um, you having a, a little a bit of an iffy microbiome, and then you're not creating as much serotonin, you're not creating as much of those good neurotransmitters. So that's going to go right up to your brain, you're going to feel a little depressed, you're going to feel a little bit anxious. When you feel depressed and anxious, that then signal, sends a signal to your gut too, to be a little bit more dysregulated. Vicious cycle. But mm -hmm. all, you know, there's a lot of therapies that are clinically studied to really, really support if you can work on your brain and a gut at the same time, that's when you're going to feel your best. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's where a lot of, you know, more holistic specialties are, are looking when it comes to gut health is um, kind of like we were talking about earlier and just in your body holistically. Well, you know, how, how can we understand how a stressful moment is then going to affect our gut? Um, and the bigger part of this, and what I think is the most important part of the gut brain connection is what's happening to your gut under long-term stress, because we, as a society, accept long-term chronic stress as just a normal way of life right. where everyone always talks about how stressed they are, how busy they are. It's, it's normal. I mean, really like think about if you catch up with friends or you haven't talked to someone in a while and you ask them how they are, it's usually, Oh, so busy at work. It's so stressed. And you ask them how work is. It's stressful. I never have time for a break. And that's normalized. And that's, you know, applauded. Actually, we, we talked about this a bit earlier. So what's happening is, our body is not made to sustain that. That is that is just not how our body works is to live in this capitalism culture, this hustle, hustle, hustle culture. So our nervous system is trying to protect us. And I think that's what's really, really important to understand. Even when it's dysregulated, it's trying to protect you. Your nervous system is your friend. It's not something to get mad at. It's something to nurture and to understand because everything that's happening, even the things that feel bad to you, it's still trying to protect you. So one major way that it's trying to protect you is you feel chronic stress. 
your nervous system doesn't know that that stress is not an actual threat to your survival in the way that millions of years ago, feeling an intense, stressful moment actually meant that there's a bear over there that you need to run from instead of there's an email from your boss over here that's really making you go bonkers. So it's going to start to prepare your body physically to survive. It's going to release a lot of cortisol. That's going to make your blood pressure go up, your blood sugar go up. And what it's going to do is it's going to take all of that energy that would go to digestion and put it elsewhere. Because if you're in a life or death situation and your body needs to protect you and you need to survive, it really doesn't matter if you're digesting your lunch right now. That's not a good use of energy. The flip side of this, you know, what's called a fight or flight response, this cortisol, this activation, this go, 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 got to fight, got to survive. It's called rest and digest. No one ever talks about that. I think, you know, most of the time when I'm talking to clients about fight or flight versus rest and digest, everyone knows what fight or flight is. No one knows what rest and digest is. It's the opposite side. You know, your body is in one or the other. Sympathetic, fight or flight, parasympathetic, rest and digest. Imagine you're constantly in fight or flight. So obviously you're not going to be able to digest because you're never in rest and digest. And that's, you know, that's what's going on. Your body's not putting blood flow to your stomach. Your acid secretion, your enzyme secretion isn't working. Your motility is going to be affected. You know, how quickly you can pass food through the digestive tract. All of that is going to get very, very out of whack because it's not a priority for survival at all. When this happens long-term, because that's kind of what modern life is, or we're not really taught tools to regulate our nervous system and to kind of intentionally switch it from fight or flight into rest and digest. Um, and we kind of think living in fight or flight is normal. So if you think about years and years of living this way and having very small moments of rest and digest, your stomach's always going to hurt because you're not digesting your food. And if you're not digesting your food, it's just going to be pain. And then you're going to feel like crap because you're not actually assimilating all those vitamins and nutrients that your body needs to sustain life. So that's kind of the what I think is the, the most interesting. I mean, I think it's super interesting. There's a lot of studies about how the state of your microbiome impacts anxiety and depression and how it's actually impacting mental health disorders because of that neurotransmitter interaction and because of that vagus nerve that's connecting everything. What I think needs to be talked about more is what I think is more relevant, and this is definitely, you know, a bias of of my situation and the client base that I work with, but I think it's so relevant is you can take your probiotic. You can go through this gut healing protocol that that you bought off of Instagram. You can do all of this stuff, but if you don't get to the root cause of, well, I'm stuck in fight or flight. So this is going to perpetuate until I figure that out. That's to me, the game changer. Mm -hmm. You can regulate your nervous system. You can regulate everything. You can avoid this burnout. You can avoid the fatigue. You can allow your body to function in the most optimal way. That's my focus when it comes to gut health a lot. Just it is super relevant to the people that I work with. And it was the it was a game changer for me. Um, did that make sense? What do you think? No, thank you. That was that was brilliant. Um no, really, yeah. Uh because I hadn't I hadn't thought about it like that. Like even if you are eating the appropriate foods. Great. You have, you drink the mm -hmm. greens juice, you get what all that, you know, all the good stuff. Yep. It's still not being directed into the right way. Your body's not still able to absorb it. So it's still, your body still feels like undernourished and yeah. yeah like, is, am I, am I receiving that right? Yeah. And it's not always that it's just, it's going to feel undernourished, but it's actually going to be undernourished. Mm. And the, the other thing that's happening and this happens mostly in, in your burnout and the chronic stress, your body, we eat food because we need these nutrients to make all these different processes go. Um, I hate how there's just so much talk about food is just about physical appearance, being attractive, getting to a certain weight. That's not why we eat. If we don't eat, we die because our body sustains on this food. And there's a reason why we need a certain amount of vitamin C and vitamin D. There are processes in our body that will simply not be able to work if it doesn't have that vitamin. At the same time, you know, there's all these different processes going on all the time. It's really, truly amazing. The body is an amazing thing. Now, if you are upregulating a pathway, let's say you upregulate a pathway that needs vitamin C, 
Well, now you need a shit ton of vitamin C because you are just burning through it. And that's what happens a lot with burnout too, is you may be eating inadequate enough and maybe you're digesting and assimilating an adequate enough uh, amount of whatever vitamin, mineral, nutrient, but your body's demand is significantly higher because it is constantly in a state of stress. It's constantly churning on all these different hormones because it thinks it needs a shit ton more cortisol and everything's dysregulated. So it's, you know, you're inflamed, you know, when you have this chronic inflammation, you're just burning through all of these at a higher rate than what a, a healthy individual would. So that can be even more frustrating and, um, you know, hopeless, honestly, for people is I'm eating everything right, but I still feel terrible every day. And so it's never enough. You know, if your body isn't in a state of equilibrium, then, you know, these standard amounts of vitamin C that you need, it's never going to be enough to sustain what your poor body is, is doing to try to keep you to survive. You know, it's trying to protect you. It's trying to do the best it can. Um, and to do that, it's, it's really upregulating certain processes that's just churning through and eating up all of your vitamins and minerals. So you're not going to feel good because you don't have enough. Yeah. Yeah. The bo the body is, is incredible. It's so adaptable and it's, a, it's adapting to what it's thinks it's happening to prepare you for that next event. Yeah. And we sort of got to re retrain it. And, um, yeah, it, it obviously makes me think of the mind body connection, which is also now getting a lot more press. Yeah. Because, you know, it was always treated as two separate beings. Mm -hmm. But you, what you're explaining here is that it's bi-directional. Everything that happens, gut, body, will happen in the mind and, and the other way around too. So yeah. we, have to, we have to treat sort of everything all together. But as you relayed in the beginning, everyone's a specialist at one thing. And again, not demonizing that. It's very important yeah. to be specialized mm -hmm. in those certain areas because a lot of these really <clears throat> pervasive disorders need that someone who's like, fucking expert in it, like has saved hundreds of lives. Awesome. But for the regular person who just wants to live a fulfilled, meaningful life, we have to have these things get interjoined. We have to be able to sort of work on multiple things at once. But the, the most important point I think you mentioned was getting to the root of it. You have to get all the way down underneath it all. And then, you know, start to build up from there, like you would like, a, you know, a massive skyscraper or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what's important about these conversations with mind body connection is being super clear that we're not saying it's all in your head because that is oh, a no. very harmful narrative that yeah. people who have these more subtle, ongoing, non-clinical symptoms get told is, well, there's nothing physically wrong with you. So why don't you go see a psychiatrist? And that can be really, really hurtful and demeaning and just like a horror, very dismissive, super, super dismissive. Um, and that's what I try to be very, very careful about when I'm, when I'm talking with clients is sometimes, you know, I may work with someone who hasn't really figured it out yet. You know, they may, I'm a little bit stressed. They haven't figured out, you know, just how deep it, this is all, this is all working. And the last thing you want to do is, is make someone feel worse about themselves. And like the experience they're having physically isn't valid or that it's their fault that they feel something physically because they can't control their own mind. And that's what this, like, you know, it's all in your head idea says is you're, you're doing this to yourself. It's your fault. There's nothing wrong with you. Go figure it out. Go talk to a therapist, go take a pill. And that's really harmful. So if we can explain to people, there is a physiological occurrence right now. This is not in your head. You are not making it up. What you're feeling physically is true. It is valid. It is happening. That's true. You know, like really like sit with them. Yes, that is happening. Let me tell you physiologically what happens in your brain that can downstream have these effects that can make people feel much more motivated into understanding their body um, and hopefully not scare them away from the idea that mental health is something they should probably consider. Yeah. <clears throat> what I, I talk about, I talk about mental health a lot because I have a, a very personal connection with it and the things that I talk about for mental health are the four pillars of what I think are like being a functional human being, which has nothing to do with your mind. It's just eating well, moving well, sleeping well, and thinking well. None of those things are like, like psychologically, like, like whatever you want. I don't even know what word to describe it, but most people yeah. think that if they're having, if they're having a psychological issue that it has to do something with their mind, but mostly it's what's happening in your environment. 
Are you having something at home? Like, are you, did your dog just die? Like, are you going Mm -hmm. through a rough thing at school? Like your parents get divorced. All of those are environmental that'll cause some psychological issues, especially for a young person. Like, are you just watching the news too much? Cause that's like, can bring on a lot of different things and feelings about the world and how you feel about yourself. And like all of that stuff is part of your real world, not just something that lives inside of your brain. Now, of course, there are moments in time where people sort of just feel sad for no reason, but there's always something like not no reason, like there's something always underlying, 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 but they might just be sad that day. And that's all right too. Like we also have to explain Mm -hmm. to them that like not every day is gonna be the happiest day of your life. And you can recognize that today is just a little bit tougher but I'm still alive. I'm still Mm -hmm. worthy to go through the day. I'm still enough. I can still do maybe one or two things that might help me take care of myself. But today is just going to be that day, but I'm still going to move through the world because I'm a person and I can do this. And if we can explain it in that way, um, rather than a different way, like "Mm, you're crazy, it's in your head. It's not that bad. Suck it up. Take it. Mm, Okay. Stop. Whatever. Hush, hush. All those things that maybe might've been said to you sort of in your life. It's important. And then, you know, thinking about, you know, eating well, moving well, sleeping well, and thinking well, like Mm -hmm. those are complicated things. You have to get to the sort of how you might be able to move those levers or get those rocks into the container. But if you can start there, it seems less complicated than trying to change your whole life all at once in this very moment. That's hard. Like, yeah, uh, at least I thought, I think so. It is. And what stands out to me, and I, I think about this a lot when I'm working with people is your these pillars that you're describing, they are hard. It's not easy to eat well. It's not easy to take care of your mind. It's not easy to sleep. It's not easy to do these things. But in the scheme of medical intervention, they're very simple, very, very simple. So I think when people are feeling really bad and they seek out a specialist because they want to feel better, um, they're expecting these crazy herbal concoctions and these <laughs> really crazy routines. So I need to ice plunge in the morning and then like do this at night and then go to a sauna and then take 80 supplements. No, that's not what you need to do. You got to start with the foundations. Mm -hmm. Um, And if more people were educated on the value of those foundations, which are much more accessible because these crazy interventions that yes, I'm sure can create some sort of outcome. And there's always a time and a place for these. They're expensive. They're not very accessible. And that can lead to this feeling of hopelessness is also I've heard that there is an answer out there for me, but I can't afford it. And that's an awful, awful feeling to feel like you can't take care of yourself. If we talk to more about these basic things that don't cost, you know, anything, I mean, food, of course, costs something. But if we could talk about these baseline foundational things that you don't actually need a professional to pay or to pay a professional to get this advice, but could be really life changing for you. And that makes healthcare so much more accessible. That makes self-care so much more accessible. And doing it all at once, yeah, that's going to feel terrible. You know, having to really take a hard look at your life, if you even think about food and and movement and your mind, like that's super overwhelming. And you may just totally crash and be so overwhelmed by how awful you feel that you don't even do anything. And then you may need some professional guidance with it. But if you can think about, and if we can educate more people on this foundational lifestyle habits and why they matter, what's going to happen physiologically as we make these little, little changes, and how is something so small, like taking 10 minutes of your day to breathe, like not opening your phone in the morning, like not scrolling through social media at night before you go to bed. These little things have a profound impact on our nervous system. They have a profound impact on the way we feel, our biochemical pathways. And they can be life changing. And sometimes people don't want to hear it because it feels too simple to work. And that's what breaks my heart too, is it, it feels not big enough because when we think about medical interventions, we usually think big, crazy, extreme, but that's not always the answer. And I always start people on like those basic foundations because that's, you might be okay after that you know everyone's at a different level and may need some more stuff but you'd be amazed when you start taking care of your sleep habits when you take a hard look about the people that you're spending time with and um, you look at how you're eating and the physical state that you're in if you're stressed out when you're eating that's not going to go well those little things could could be your answer and that doesn't have to be expensive it doesn't have to be extreme it doesn't have to feel inaccessible yes perfectly said how how do you think about um, breathing or meditating, uh, even for yourself, or how are you engaging it with your clients? 
Yeah. Um, it's a really important practice for me. And it's something I fucking hated when I started. I mean, <laughs> hate it. I, oh my yeah, God. I yeah. saw on Instagram um, that you posted something about having a panic attack the first time that you, um, yeah, that you tried it. I did. Yeah. And I, and that happened for about two or three weeks straight, to be honest. Really? <laughs> it was very bad. Yeah. So I was in, I've always, I grew up and I was a dancer. I've always been very connected to, to movement and I feel a lot of relief doing you know, physical outlets for emotion. Um, back when I had this incident in college, and I had all these stomach issues. I got introduced to yoga and it really changed my life. It was the only time during my day that I felt okay. And, you know, I found a studio that I just completely fell in love with back when I lived in Boston. They had 90 minute classes. Um, and it was incredible the physical change that I felt. I could go into the class feeling on the verge of a panic attack. I used to have really, really bad headaches. And by the end of the class, I would just be better. Um, so I got really connected to to breath and the power of, of movement for mental health. For me at that point, I still wasn't super advanced with my understanding of the nervous system. So, and I, I really thought it was well, I'm, I'm moving. It's almost like a form of dance. That's what's really helping me. But I didn't take that practice outside that space. It was just, I do this for 90 minutes a day. I feel okay for those 90 minutes. Then I wake up tomorrow and my life's going to be a hellhole. And I'm going to have to get through it and get to 530 when I can go to this class and maybe things will feel a little bit better. So as I've kind of advanced, gone through you know, a lot of personal challenges, when I started meditating, um, and this was recent, this was less than two years ago. And this is when I hit my absolute breaking point. And I just, I could not literally figure out how to get myself off the floor. And I had some really amazing therapists that I was working with. And I mean, I think there's a, there's a range of people, there's a range of techniques and personalities, and it takes time to really find the therapist that like gets you and can speak to you and you can communicate with. And she really challenged me to do it. And I was like, that sounds fucking terrible. I'm not doing this. <laughs> But I was like, sure, you know what? Because, you know, again, I'm intellectualizing this. So I look at all the research and I'm like, okay, you know, meditation has this effect on your brain chemistry. It can affect your neurotransmitters in this way. So I guess this is worthwhile. Um, and it was one of the worst experiences ever because at that point I was in a real, real rough place. And I sat down and I played this little meditative guided thing and it started talking me through my body. It was a, a, a guided like body meditation, which I recommend to people now. I, at the time, thought it would be easier to have a guided meditation versus just sit there in my silence with my horrible thoughts. Um, so I did this guided meditation and it made me pay attention to every aspect of my body. And I just freaked out, completely freaked out. Because when I actually listened to my body, it was screaming. Like I was like, well, you know, it's telling you to pay attention to your chest. I'm like, well, I feel like I can't breathe. I actually think I'm going to die right now or pay attention to the muscles in your hands. Well, I feel like they can't clench harder. Like they're just actually going to explode. Everything felt terrible. And that's what I needed was to pay attention to my body. Cause that's what I was avoiding for so long was just like overpowering it and really just being conflict <laughs> avoidant and not wanting to know how bad things were. Um, but it was a novel experience and I wanted to keep trying it because of these studies that I read and eventually, and it took weeks, like I, it was probably two or three weeks before I, I could do it without actually spiraling into a panic and being able to breathe. Um, it would make things worse. And I warn clients about this and we talk about it is that when you're really paying attention to your breath and you're anxious, you can start to breathe really heavily into your chest instead of down in your belly. And that's what causes can, can bring on a panic attack. Um, because you're telling your nervous system, I can't breathe, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. And then it's going to start to to spiral. And boom, next thing you know, you got the complete opposite effect that you wanted. But you got to stick with it and you got to try it. There's a couple of different ways that I talk about meditation with people. If you try something, and this might, this goes for yoga, this goes for meditation, any sort of breathing exercise. If you do it and you feel uncomfortable and you come back to me and you just go, oh, I just didn't like it. I was bored. I couldn't shut my thoughts off. Da, 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 da. Consider that what you hate is actually what you need. Mm -hmm. You're so used to going, 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 feeling productive, not paying attention to your body, just allowing thoughts to just take over. It's going to feel super, super uncomfortable. It's not, it's not something that you're used to doing. So you're going to hate it. And you could have a, a really bad reaction also. But consider your body is trying to tell you something and that what sucks so bad right now might actually be what saves you 
in the next couple of months. So keep trying. And if you say you hate it, I'm really going to challenge you on why. A lot of the time I get, I'm bored. And those are typically the people that can't ever stop doing anything. Of course, you're bored. You're uncomfortable with doing nothing. You're uncomfortable with stillness. You want to feel productive all the time. Allow yourself to be bored and see what happens in a few months. At the same time, sometimes meditation, just people don't like it. Um, and there's a lot of different ways you can focus on your breath and connect with your body. A lot of different types of meditation too. I like to be very clear that I'm not at all forcing any sort of religion or spiritual practice. This is really just a nervous system regulation technique. It has a direct effect on your nervous system if you can slow your breathing. And if you can do that, even for five, 10 minutes a day, the results are going to be pretty profound. And I encourage them to keep going just to see what happens. Um, that there is a lot of different techniques you can do to relax. Meditation is something that just ended up working for me. Uh, the other kind of feedback that I get of people who tried and don't like it is there's this idea that meditation means you don't think. And that's the complete opposite of what it actually means. So it's pretty much impossible, you know, to, to turn off your mind. You know, you could practice for decades and become a Buddhist monk and actually be able to not think. That's not realistic. That's not going to happen for most of us. And it's not a failure if you're meditating and you have shitty thoughts going around your head. That's going to happen. And that's actually kind of the purpose. Let it come in. Let it come in. These thoughts that you don't want to think about, let them come. You're going to feel terrible sometimes. Let it happen. What the advanced practice of meditation is, is can we acknowledge those and let them be instead of reacting? So instead of thinking um, this terrible thought comes in, maybe you have this limiting belief that you're never going to be good enough about a certain thing. And then that comes into your head while you're meditating. And then you start to feel guilt and shame and all of these negative emotions. What if you could acknowledge that thought and just go, okay, that's just the thought right now. I don't have to react to it. I'm just going to let it go. That's when the beauty and the power and the real results of meditation comes. These thoughts are always going to come up. It's not possible to turn off your brain. You're not a failure if you're not turning off your brain. But what an incredible and powerful tool to hear a thought that comes into your head and not immediately have a reaction and not immediately believe it. Because unfortunately, we cannot believe our own minds. Yeah. Meditation creates that space. Um, and it's just a really powerful, powerful tool. I always recommend it, some type of breathing exercise, especially since I am often working with digestive clients. And that doing that deep breathing, since it does impact your nervous system, doing that before a meal is really going to support digestion. And doing it in a moment of an extreme GI distress event, um, extreme cramping, extreme burning will actually bring down those symptoms because you're telling your nervous system it's okay to, to relax. You're not in danger right now. You don't feel good but you're not in danger. And that's going to bring all of these physical sensations down and your pain perception is going to go a bit down too. There's a lot of different ways to do it. Um, I'm always trying to get someone to find some sort of breathing exercise to do, but more deeper than that is, is there something that they can do that brings them stillness that allows them to sit with themselves and their thoughts and their body and be okay with that and not feel like it's a negative or unproductive thing. Um, and allows them to force themselves to pay attention to what their body is telling them and what their mind is telling them that really an intentional time, that self-reflection time is so critical. That's something that's another skill we're not taught. I feel like I touched on this earlier is really paying attention to our body, but man, I I've learned so much about how I'm feeling once I started paying attention to my body and not even just in meditation, you know, I'll feel certain things, but if you're ever just thinking about something like, Oh, I'm, I'm not, something feels off. I'm not sure what it is. If you just kind of sit and you kind of go through all the different areas of your life, wait for the one area that you think about when you kind of just start to tense up and your chest starts to feel a little bit tight. That's the problem. And you might not have consciously thought about that yet, but subconsciously your body's like, okay, I'm thinking about um, my work situation. I think about my friends. I think about my loved ones and I feel good. And I start thinking about work and then everything just starts to tense and my stomach starts to hurt. There you go. You know, tuning into your body in whatever way you can is an incredible, powerful tool for self-control. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's a, it's a beautiful life changing practice. That is because we all breathe obviously, but mm -hmm. if you think, if you can think about, breathing intentionally and optimally in a different way like like your breath is like 
you know, your best friend or an anchor or like yeah. a life force that like emanates from you that you can use yeah. as a tool to, you mm -hmm. know, to have a better life. And then like, and then as you're saying, you start to connect more with your body. And so you start to have more a uh, better feeling about your intuition, then you actually trust your intuition, then you actually trust yourself, and then you're actually moving in the right direction, rather than being sort of, you know, like you can start to feel like, okay, this is where I'm meant to be, this is where I'm supposed to be going. Yeah. And all of those things sort of start to, start to come in alignment, you know, simply by focusing on your breathing, the inhale, the exhale, getting into your belly, you know, sitting down for a minute, 30 mm -hmm. seconds, whatever you can handle uh, is is important. Yeah, I think that, you know, feeling your body and trusting it's important. And one thing that a therapist told me, same, same one, um, that I will always think of is there was one time I used to have these strong gut feelings, like, oh, I have to do this, I have to do this, I have to. And then one day I said, you know, I just don't feel that anymore. Have I lost my intuition? And she said, have you ever considered that what you thought were your gut feelings was actually just anxiety? And I was like, oh, wow. that was a life changing thought. That, uh, you know, it's, I thought, you know, my body's, my gut is telling me, so we talk about that, like, your gut feeling, my gut's telling me to run, to do this, to do this. And like, oh, my anxiety was funny. I felt that in my gut. And to really like take the time to find out what, you know, what a real gut feeling and intuition is. That took a long time, but very cool. Very cool. Well, kudos to that therapist. She seems like a rock star. Oh yeah. Yeah. Complete badass. Love her to death. Yeah. But, um, all right. Where should people go if they, uh, if they want more of you, Taylor? If you want more, you can check out my website. Um, I always do free calls with people. I want to make sure we're a good fit if you need any sort of help. I'm also just happy to give a little bit of free advice because I think healthcare is so inaccessible and I want to be part of that change. You can follow me on Instagram if you want. I try to be very evidence-based, very chill with my advice. Please DM me again if you have a quick question. I'm, you know, You don't know if you should take this supplement. You've read this thing online. I want to help. I want to help you feel empowered in your body any avenue that you can. I don't want anyone to think that they can't get support because they can't afford it. Yeah. Beautiful. All that will be uh, linked in the show notes below. But uh, thank you cool. for your time. I appreciate you. This was awesome. And uh, thank you. Yeah, I appreciate what you're doing. Yeah, right back at you. If you enjoyed that episode, please click here for another full length episode of the podcast. And please don't forget to subscribe. But above all else, above all else, most importantly, please, please take good care of yourselves and others. And I'll see you next time. Lots of love. Cheers.